Hello, my name is Kim Eagle for ACC.org. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we're covering the, the key clinical trials at the ESC meeting this year. These trials today we're talking about are from Monday, August 28th. I'm delighted to be joined by three clinical trial experts. We have Gabrielle Steg from Paris, France, Kyle Coley from uh, Denver, Colorado, and uh, Darren Kambani, who is from Dallas, Texas. We're going to talk today about three trials, uh, different topics, but very important, we think. The first one is called Aramis. Uh, Gabrielle, tell us about this trial. Yes, it's an interesting trial because it focuses on a condition that really hasn't been studied that much and for which we don't have much evidence and benefits of treatment and which treatment to use. Acute myocarditis, um, what the uh, authors posited was that uh, interfering with the immune one, uh, interleukin one beta pathway using anakinra might improve the outcomes of these patients. So they did a randomized trial where uh, patients received anakinra or placebo. The primary efficacy endpoint was a, a measure of the number of days alive free of any myocarditis complication defined as heart failure requiring admission, chest pain requiring medication, decreasing LVF below 50% of ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, what they found is, unfortunately, there is no clear reduction in these primary outcomes. So no clear benefit of anakinra compared to placebo in acute myocarditis. The treatment was well tolerated, but that being said, the trial was relatively small and numerically there were far fewer events in the treatment arm than in the placebo arm, suggesting that maybe a larger trial could uh, show benefit or maybe a better selection of patients might be able to find a subgroup that has benefit. So I don't think we have the final word on this. But we should complement the uh, the investigators on conducting these difficult trials. Kyle, what do you think? You know, myocarditis is one of the most challenging conditions to treat as a cardiologist, just because, as Gabriel said, there's so little that we understand about the disease process, and it's incredibly heterogeneous. And that may be another reason for why this trial came out negative, because we lump all the different types of myocarditis you know, into the same sort of pathways. But we may need to start getting more granularity and perhaps using cardiac MRI, just as these authors did, not just to understand whether somebody has myocarditis, but also the distribution, the type of scar tissue, the degree of edema, that may help us in the future try to start personalizing some of these treatments. But I agree with Gabriel that anti-inflammatories, I think it physiologically makes sense for myocarditis and, and trying to understand which anti-inflammatory, the timing of it, and also the dose of it in which patient populations is where I hope that research continues to go. I agree, and I hope that uh, I hope a larger trial could be done that really would uh, see if this hint of a favorable effect is real or just the play of chance. There's another trial today that caught our attention. It's called Wright. Um, please tell us about that trial, Gabrielle. So Wright is a Chinese trial that looks at post-procedural anticoagulation in STEMI patients who've been treated with primary PCI using bivarudin as an anticoagulant. As you know, the uh, Wright 4 trial conducted in China did demonstrate a benefit of bivarudin compared to heparin, so it's widely used in China. It's a fairly large trial of 3,000 patients, and it asks itself, is there a benefit to prolonged anticoagulation versus no anticoagulation? And the second question is, which agent should be used? And fractured heparin, enoxaparin, or prolonged bivarudin infusion? So the answer to the first question is, there was no benefit of prolonged anticoagulation in reducing ischemic outcomes at 30 days. So really no signal, no hint of benefit. The second question is more difficult to interpret because the assignment to the various anticoagulants was not randomized. That being said, there was heterogeneity in the response and it's, there's a suggestion that the outcomes appeared better in those patients who received enoxaparin. Whether this reflects selection bias or a choose benefit uh, in enoxaparin over the other treatments, I think deserves further investigation. Right. Yes. Without randomization, it's really hard to interpret that signal uh, in any particular fashion. There's another trial today that caught our interest called ACO-DVT. Darum, tell us about that clinical trial. 
Yeah, thanks. So, you know, the, the treatment for cancer-associated DVT, especially in those with active cancer, um, you know, there is uh, some question about sort of the right approach, especially for um, isolated distal DVT, below the knee DVTs. Now, you know, there is good evidence that um, uh, the NOACs are as uh, efficacious as, you know, low molecular weight heparin, for example, for treating uh, this condition. But the duration of that treatment, and, and as I said, specifically for below the knee DVTs is unclear. Uh, and so this was a really well-conducted study done um, in 601 patients in Japan, where they randomized patients who had um, isolated distal DVTs either three months or 12 months with edoxaban. Now, they used 60 milligrams a day, which is the treatment dose of edoxaban, um, and it was dose reduced based on either body weight or kidney function, actually in the majority of patients, 75% down to 30 milligrams a day. The primary endpoint of this study um, at 12 months was either symptomatic recurrent venous thromboembolic disease or VTE-related death. And this was overwhelmingly um, positive in favor of 12-month uh, duration of edoxaban, an 87% reduction over this duration. And interestingly, they did not see a, an increase in bleeding with this strategy. So suggesting that if you had a patient with isolated distal DVTs, um, you would potentially anticoagulate them for at least 12 months based on, on this trial. So I think this is a very important trial for the field. I think it's an important advance for the field. Um, it does bring up some questions. Um, primarily, uh, to my mind, were, uh, you know, only 20% of patients in this trial had symptomatic DVT. And so is there a role for routine surveillance uh, ultrasound in these patients? Um, and also sort of getting into the field of prophylactic um, use of anticoagulation in patients with, uh, you know, at high risk for malignancies, for example, certain patients with metastatic disease or pancreatic cancer or other GI malignancies. Uh, there have been two trials that have specifically looked at that question, and the data has been a little underwhelming uh, on that end, but perhaps, uh, you know, a strategy such as this, uh, you know, maybe I'll put a study in the future as well. Yeah, those are great questions. Certainly, the, the mechanism of the provocation of the DVT is still present in the cancer patient. So the notion that we could just stop after three months is um, it's a hopeful thought, but this trial I think clearly shows that that's not the case. The good news is the bleeding rate seemed to be low and uh, that, that certainly is, is good for our patients. I wanna thank you, Gabriel, Pyle, and uh, Durham for your excellent analysis. Uh, the ACC team enjoys bringing you these clinical trials from the big meetings, and this is from the, the Monday of ESC 2023. Um, this is Kim Eagle for ACC.org, and we're out. <laughs>